All right, hi everyone. Um, my name is Russ Joseph. Um, I'm a professor at Northwestern University, and uh, I'm here today to talk to you about multi-core architectures. Um, so I'm going to try to be pretty selective in what I'm talking about today, but hopefully uh, there'll be something new and interesting for most of you. All right, so over the uh, past decade, we've seen uh, tremendous uh, development in multi-core systems. Um, so in terms of both, we've seen some uh, enhancements at the core level, component cores, and uh, a multitude of ways to compose cores, cache, and interconnect to build interesting systems. Um, and what I want to do today is I want to give you a little bit of an appreciation for some of the things that are under the hood in a modern multi-core system and talk a little bit about ways in which you can benefit from uh, levering knowledge as a programmer. Uh, so in these systems, um, we have all sorts of very complex types of interaction between the application and the underlying architecture. And it's going to be very, very difficult in general to predict performance uh, beforehand. Um, so knowledge of the microarchitecture and how things are put together can be useful for you as a programmer to tune things. So I'm going to focus on a fairly basic, fairly vanilla homogeneous system. All right, so we're not going to do anything with GPUs or vectorization or anything else. Um, but there's still, even without those sort of bells and whistles, there's still a lots of complexity and lots of different ways in which uh, you can sometimes get unexpected results. So I'm going to start at a very low level here, as low as you can go, um, at the transistor level, and build up from there. And uh, my reason for starting at sort of the bottom of the system stack is that you know, even though transistors and thinking about transistors are not going to be important for most programmers on a day-to-day -day basis, having a good intuition for what's happening can be useful. So if you understand what the system is uh, doing kind of at the ground up, um, it gives you a good appreciation for why things are the way they are, right? So why the designers chose to do this one way and do something else another way, all right? Um, and in addition to this, it's going to help you to understand some of these trends over time. So that's, that's my motivation for starting at the bottom, okay? So we're going to start talking about how can you build a system with transistors, and we'll get pretty quickly up to a um, higher level pretty quickly. So um, you can think of transistor as really, at the end of the day, just a switch, right? And even though it's just, you can think of it as a simple switch, right? We can build lots of really, really interesting things just out of switches. So the transistors that we use in our designs today are field effect transistors, or FETs. Um, and they are, uh, as I said, really just, you can think about them, or you should really just think about them as simple switches. Um, and there are two uh, variants that we have, PMOS and NMOS, right? Positive and negative. Um, and CMOS, right, is the dominant design paradigm where we're going to use these PMOS and NMOS transistors in a complementary fashion to build all sorts of different things, both logic and memory. Right. So one of my motivations for starting with the transistor is to kind of emphasize some of the physical properties that exist in the system, uh, components in the system. And to really understand what's going on, you have to be able to think about them for a second at the transistor level. right? So these transistors are physical devices that have physical measurable dimensions and properties. And these physical properties determine or influence a lot of the basic functionality that we have throughout the system, right? So in particular, right, so we have constraints that we have to work around with, we have to work around. So, you know, these transistors have physical dimensions, right? And um, that turns into, you know, a physical constraint, um, a physical sizing for the transistors, which is, uh, ties into the die area constraints that we have, 
these uh, transistors have switching speeds, right? And that's gonna affect all of our latencies throughout the system, right? And perhaps most critically, they have power consumption, right? So both dynamic and static power, right? And that's gonna influence basically everything, right? So the whole reason why we have multi-core systems is not because someone thought it was a good way to build a system. It's basically because we couldn't build uniprocessor systems at the continued pace that we wanted to. So, you know, because they were not going to be thermally viable, so we had to give up on that and we had to build sort of scale back our cores and give you more cores at a lower frequency and a lower um, power footprint than we would have liked to. And that's, where, that's why we are where we are. So circuit designers can um, optimize your transistor parameters to make all sorts of interesting trade-offs, right? So you can choose to make the transistors larger and that will make them faster, but they're gonna consume more area and they're gonna consume more power, right? So the designer has to balance how much, uh, how, how, they, how they want to use these transistors to get the desired results, right? All right, and more kind of, even more interestingly, you can apply sort of different sorts of trade-offs at different parts, uh, different locations in the system, right? So cases where uh, performance is critical, latency is critical, you're gonna upsize these transistors and you're gonna make them faster, right? And places where latency is not as critical, you can downsize them, make them smaller, and you'll trade off some energy efficiency, uh, you'll trade off some uh, performance for energy savings. All right, so these physical constraints are gonna be important because they shape all the, designs, all the design choices that we see in the system. So you can build, um, you can take these transistors and put them together first to build logic, right? So you can build simple, uh, all of your simple kind of logic gates, right? Not NAND, NOR, AND, OR, and what have you. And you can uh, compose these logic gates in interesting ways to build, basically compute anything you want to compute, just about. So in addition to logic, right, we also use transistors to build state elements, right? All right. And these state elements are just basically storage elements, and um, they're just holding data. And the two uh, state elements I want to focus on here are a 1T design for DRAM and the 6T uh, design for SRAM. So the DRAM design, right, one transistor uh, design. It's extremely dense, right, because you just basically have one transistor and a capacitor, that's it, right? All of your state is stored on the capacitor, right? So this is extremely uh, efficient in terms of energy, or in terms of, of, of area. So it's very dense, so you can fit lots of them in a DRAM chip, for example, right? That gives you great density. Uh, on the other hand, because of the way it's constructed, right, that storage capacitor leaks, right? So it, it, it's charges, it's charged, it, it's charged it dissipates over time. So you have to refresh the DRAM to keep it to keep the data viable. Right. Right. So it's going to be very dense, but you have to refresh it periodically. Right. So the SRAM cell, on the other hand, um, does not need to be refreshed but it's not as dense, right, because we have six transistors now versus one, right? So you're not, you're not, not gonna get, you're not gonna be able to pack as many bits into a given uh, fixed area. And then in addition, right, these uh, SRAM cells are leaky because of the way the transistors are oriented. All right, so throughout the system, we can choose different types of storage depending on our needs, right? So you want, near the processor when you want to have fast caches and register files and what have you, you'll use SRAM. And further away, where you're more concerned about capacity, right, and you're not as concerned about latency, you can use DRAMs, right? So caches versus main memory, for example. 
So the other important thing to keep in mind here is that even though I'm, just, uh, I'm talking primarily about transistors, wires in our systems have delay too, right? And this actually turns out to be in most memories, right? Most memories are wire, uh, wire delays are actually what dominate, right? Because it takes time to propagate a signal across a chip. Okay, so that's all I need to say about transistors. So how can you put these transistors together to do interesting things, all right? So let's look first at the core, all right? So if I think about how I might build a simple CPU, the kind of obvious way that I might think about doing it from a programmer's perspective is to basically have build the, put the components together in a way that allows them to execute the instructions in my program in a sequential pat, uh, manner, right? Purely sequential, right? All right, and so this is the obvious way to do it. And it turns out it's gonna be um, economical because um, you're not doing anything fancy, you're just basically processing the instructions in a straightforward manner, and it's gonna be fit completely with the programmer's view of the system. So it turns out, though, this is a terrible way to build a computer, right? So upon further reflection, right, what you would see is that all of the instructions, right, um, there's, sub there's substantial um, ways in which you can overlap their execution, right? So while you're beginning doing one part of processing one part of an instruction, you can get started on the next one, right? And that, thinking about it this way, leads to a pipeline design, right? So in particular here, what I'm showing is, is a scalar pipeline, and as you can see, the execution of our instructions are now overlapped, right? So what we're gonna do um, is this will allow us to greatly improve our throughput, right? So we can now basically um, begin a new instruction. We don't have to wait until the previous instruction has completed entirely. Right? So we can get very significant improve, improvement in throughput. And we're not necessarily going to improve the latency of any one instruction. Right? In addition, um, we're going to have a new issue to, to think about. We're going to have dependencies between some of these instructions. And there are going to be times where we're going to need to stall. But overall, this gives us a very good performance improvement, as I said, in terms of throughput, for relatively cheap uh, increase in the amount of hardware, right? So if we think back to the transistors, it turns out that what I really need to, to, to build something like this over what I had previously is actually gonna be just a small amount of storage space in terms of uh, pipeline registers, right? I don't really need to have much else in terms of new hardware, so it's gonna be relatively efficient. Okay, but we can do better, right? So if you think about it, some of these instructions, right, are actually fairly independent of each other, right? And we can actually try to execute them properly in parallel, and this is a super scalar design, right? So now I'm executing instructions in sort of pairs, and this allows you to get um, an even more uh, significant improvement, right? And basically this, this is now, I can think about a width and depth of my pipeline. So the, the width is the number of instructions that I'm executing in parallel, and the, the depth is the number of pipeline stages or the degree at which I'm applying the pipelining to improve throughput. Um, so with superscalar execution, what you're gonna now need to do is you're gonna need to rely on significant amount of speculation. So that is basically making a guess of what a result is or what some, what's going to happen before it happens. And you do this particularly with branches in which you're gonna speculate, you're gonna make a guess of which direction the branch is gonna go before, the, before you actually know for real. And you're also gonna do this with memory uh, trying to make a guess of whether or not a load in the store, for example, will interfere. So you're always going to be limited, though, by, by, by dependencies between instructions. Um, 
so this is going to cost you more in terms of hardware resources. Your transistor budget will increase significantly. Um, and some of the structures in your design will scale linearly with the width of the pipeline. And some of them will be quadratic or they're about, or you know, approximately quadratic, right? So in particular, some of the logic that you need to check for dependencies between instructions, right? That, that typically scales quadratically with the number, with the width of the pipeline. So, we're not gonna stop there, right? Because why would we stop there when we can, we can do more, right? Uh, you can recognize that some of these dependencies between these instructions that I just mentioned, right, you can detect them dynamically, right? And if you detect them dynamically, you can find ways to schedule, to reschedule the instructions dynamically based on the dependencies, all right, and potentially execute them out of order. And this is known as out of order execution. And the main idea is that um, you're, you're trying to find relationships between these instructions, and then based on the true dependencies that you discover, reschedule the instructions so you can execute them as fast as possible. And here you're gonna depend heavily on specul uh, speculation. So you, Form very, you, you apply very, very aggressive forms of speculation uh, to get good performance. Right? And so why, why would you care about, why would you want to do this out of order scheduling? What is, the, what is the main motivation? So the main motivation is that if you have a large degree of um, specul uh, speculation and you are scheduling instructions out of order, this gives you a good opportunity to hide latencies Right, in particular, hide long latency operations. So floating point instructions, right, that take many cycles to produce the results, right, or cache misses, right, potentially you can go around the cache miss and find instructions that don't depend on the data, the, the data uh, referenced by the miss and schedule them so that you can kind of overlap execution to a greater degree by going around some of these dependencies and these long stalled instructions. So this gives you great performance, um, but it turns out to be very expensive hardware-wise. So to make this happen, what you have to do is you have to have a large amount of large queues and buffers to hold waiting instructions or to allow you to look ahead to instructions that are further down the road that are independent. Right? So this is very expensive in terms of uh, hardware. Um, you're going to have lots of space for temporary storage and lots of logic to detect where the conflicts, where the dependencies are. But it allows us to get very impressive performance improvements, and that's the reason why we do it. And so if you look at a modern core, right, so this is Skylake microarchitecture, right, you can see it's pretty complex, right? So we have a pipeline that is both wide and deep, right? And we have very, very large queues and buffers to hold instructions in various stages of execution. And there's lots and lots of support for speculation in many, many different ways, many different types of speculation, right? So in particular, right, so you, you have um, out of our window of 224 instructions, right? uh, and you can allow 72 or 56 in-flight loads and stores. Um, you have a huge scheduler, almost 100 entries, and then you have a large amount of physical registers. Right? So these physical registers hold uh, the results of all the instructions that are in flight as well as the instructions that, are, that have already been committed that, that have the true architected state of the machine. Right? And as you can see, right, the width of the pipeline, in terms of execution resources, right, we have the functional units there, execution units. Right? We have a very, very wide uh, 
number of instructions that you can issue and be in, in various stages of execution simultaneously. So these are all things that promote very, very aggressive uh, performance. All right. So let me pause there right here to say, right, as I mentioned earlier, in terms of hardware resources, right, this is very expensive. All right. In terms of power expenditure, this is very expensive. So typically, as a designer, right, you have a fixed power budget that you have to abide by. So you have a choice of how aggressive you're going to make your design, your, a single core. Right? And the, the, the impact there is you can choose to have a larger number of simple cores or a smaller number of wide and very aggressive cores. So that's an important design decision. And whether or not that's the right choice will depend heavily on the workload, right? Properties of the workload, how many threads can you really extract from the workload? Right? And if, you, if, you, if, there's a lot of, if there are a lot of available threads, maybe you want to go with the simpler cores and have a larger number of them. On the other hand, if it's harder to extract thread level parallelism, Maybe you want a smaller number of beefier or more powerful cores. Right? There are lots of really interesting trade-offs. Right? And, and in this entire talk, I'm basically just focusing on symmetric designs where the cores are all the same and just replicating them. But there's a whole other direction you can go into that's heterogeneous, where you have different types of cores with different capabilities, and then there are even more sort of interesting trade-offs there. Okay. So one last thing that we can do is we can think about our pipeline for a second. And we can, if you look at this for many real workloads, many of these resources are actually going to be underutilized. Right? So there are going to be times when, for example, these execution units are sitting idle. And they're sitting idle because there's not enough instruction level of parallelism in our current workload. So one of the things you can do to try to improve the, the performance and improve utilization is try to schedule multiple threads on the same core, right? So this is known you know, in Intel parlance as hyper-threading. Uh, it was introduced originally as a concept of simultaneous multi-threading. Um, and the idea is you map uh, multiple logical cores to the same physical core, and you allow multiple threads to execute and share the resource, execution resources on the same core. All right. So typically what happens is you're going to have some slowdown in the thread level performance because these threads are sharing resources and there are going to be times where they, um, some of the resources are, even though generally speaking underutilized, there are going to be times when they are going to um, conflict and you're going to have some slowdowns on a per thread basis, but hopefully overall, you can improve throughput right? and make use of that sort of those underutilized resources. So it's this relatively modest hard hardware co cost for this actually. So this is often a, a, a pretty big win. Okay, so that's, that's, that's it for cores. So I wanna talk a little bit about caches and then I'll talk about how everything kind of fits together. Okay. So caches, I th I'm going to assume that everyone's familiar with the concept of a cache, right? So it's just fast local storage. Um, use it to hold instructions data. And this is something that if you've taken a computer, organi computer organization course, you've probably seen uh, from beginning to end every which way, right? So most of our caches in modern designs use SRAM, right? So the 6T design. Um, but there's growing importance and growing interest in building DRAM caches. Right? And I think we're going to see more of these over time. Uh, the basic idea behind caches, right, are you want to reduce the average memory access time, right? So if you go to the cache and you hit in the cache, you don't have to go to memory to get the data, right? And so the idea is that if you hit in the cache frequently, you drastically reduce your av average memory access time. 
because the cache access time is you know, typically a small number of cycles relative to the main memory. So in any standard computer organization class, the focus was probably going to be on this average memory access time. But the other things that a, that a cache do that are going to be really very, very relevant for us as we build parallel systems, right, are going to be also that you reduce interconnection traffic, right, and you reduce contention on main memory or the next level of the hierarchy, right. So these are important factors that for us in multi-core designs that are maybe not obvious when you just think about unit processor or uh, single thread workloads, but they end up being very important. So uh, the other kind of important thing is that we have some fundamental trade-offs in the cache capacity or size versus the access time, right? So the fundamental idea is that you can build a very fast cache but it's going to be relatively small capacity. Or you can build a very large cache, and it's going to be uh, relatively uh, long access time. Right. And, and this is, again, where the wire delay comes into to, to play, right? All right. So, For most workloads, we're not going to be able to fit most of our data in a small, fast cache. So our solution is to build a cache hierarchy. Right? We'll build several levels of cache. Right? Each has increasing capacity, but also correspondingly increased access latency. Right? Um, and then at each level of the cache, we can choose the associated cap and, and capacity to, to fit our workloads. Um, and then in multi-core systems, we have an additional design dimension is sort of thinking about what parts of the cache hierarchy are shared among cores and how do we connect different components in the, the system. Right? And there's lots of interesting uh, different ways that you can do this that have their, their pros and cons. Uh, in particular, um, one of the things that's, that's um, very interesting is the interconnect right, between the, the cores, right? And the, for a long time, uh, the predominant way to do this had been ring architectures, where you have a ring interconnect, right? So the data moves around in a circular fashion among the cores, right? But um, for very massive uh, core counts, this is not feasible because the latencies are really intolerable. So for um, more recent chips with sort of more massive thread counts, we've seen uh, use of mesh architectures where this is basically just sort of a, um, a grid and you can route uh, packets from one core to another along the mesh. Right. And this is far more scalable, though it signif adds significant complexity to the design of the interconnect. Right. So rings are very simple, but don't scale as well. Meshes are more scalable, but are significantly more complicated. All right, so let's talk a little bit about cache geometry for some recent designs. So um, this is a uh, Intel Skylake um, memory hierarchy. So um, the instruction caches are 32K, eight-way associative, same as the data cache, 32-way, 32K, eight-way. Uh, there's a unified per core L2 cache, so it holds instructions and data, and it can vary in size from 256K to one megabyte. Right. Four-way associative. Then the last level cache, which is a shared cache, um, can average between, it, it varies from 1.375 megabytes to 2.5. 
3.75 megabytes per core. So in this architecture, all the cache lines are 64 bytes at all levels. All right. So the L1 access latency for data, uh, so just the pure cache access latency, not including the address calculation, is four cycles for a cache hit. Right. Uh, the L2 is 12 cycles. And the L3 will vary a lot. Um, something on the range of 40 to like 77 to 80-ish cycles. So for L3 accesses. All right. So as you can see, it's a pretty large disparity in access times versus L1 versus L3. Okay. All right. So um, I don't really have enough time to talk about um, DRAM ar architecture in the way that I would like to. Um, so most systems, right, use DRAM as main memory. It's off chip, typically, very slow on the order of 200 cycles or, or more per axis, right? So the idea is that um, we can get really, really, because we're using these 1T DRAM cells, the storage density is very dense, but the uh, Access time is slow for two reasons. One, because the 1T, and then secondly, because they're off chip, right, far away. Um, so there's been a lot of, so, so because most workloads, um, most important workloads, there's no hope of fitting everything within the caches on chip, right, the DRAM performance, all right, the main memory performance tends to be very, very important overall. Um, so there's been a lot of research and a lot of development over the years, in the past decade, I would say, in particular, on DRAM architectures to improve their, their, their capabilities. Um, and there are lots of different ways to organize your, 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 your DRAM system. And, and I really don't have time to get into the details here, but it's a very, very interesting area of research. Okay. All right, so now let's get to what you can do as a programmer given all that we've talked about, right? So if we're building a parallel, if we're writing parallel software running parallel systems, right, um, your goal is to try to get linear speed up with the number of cores, right? So in, a deal, in an ideal world where we have um, unicorns and fairy princesses, we could expect to get a linear speed up, right? But we don't live in that um, fairyland reality. We live in an actual reality. And we have Amdahl's law, right? So everyone's heard of Amdahl's law. Basic idea is that uh, it's a diminishing law, it's law of diminishing returns, right? One of our most fundamental uh, truths in computer architecture. And basically what it says is that um, the serial portion of your, compu of your computation limits your overall performance, regardless of the degree of parallelism that you have, right? And um, there are lots of different sources of inefficiency, um, but one of the ones, but we're gonna focus here, so there's load balance synchronization, among other things, we're gonna focus here on communication. All right. So most of the communication in your system is going to be through uh, the memory hierarchy. And because of that, it's important to kind of revisit cache misses because they're going to factor in heavily in all of our communication. All right. So um, probably whenever you learned computer or, uh, organization, right, you probably learned about cold or compulsory misses, right? So these are data that has not been accessed yet causes a miss, right, because you haven't referenced it, it's not in the cache, right? We have conflict misses, which occur because you have insufficient associativity, right? You don't have many enough associative ways to hold all the data at the same time, right? The, 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 the blocks that you have conflict because they map to the same set and you don't have enough uh, associativity, right? So you have misses there. We have capacity misses, 
right? And this is just simply because the data does not fit in the cache. All right, so the new type of myths that we're gonna have in parallel systems are coherence misses. So now instead of three misses, three C's of cache misses, we now have four. So coherence misses occur because the data is being shared. And as we'll see in a second, what the system will do is will enforce misses to maintain the correct semantics. All right. So uh, in multi-core systems, we're going to have basically the kind of things important, the things that are the important misses tend to be or often are uh, capacity misses due to shared caches and coherence misses due to shared data. All right. So we're going to, I'm going to focus my discussion on these two. So, cache coherence, right? So, the problem that we're going to have when we have private caches in our system, right? So each core, right? As I as I showed, right, on um, these architectures, your L1 and L2 caches are private to each core. Because of that, right, we can have replicate, replicated data. Right? So you, 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 you miss in your L1 or L2, you go and you get your data from the next level of the hierarchy, and you bring a copy into your private cache. Right? Another processor has a miss on the same data, goes and retrieves it and brings it into its private cache. So now we have two copies, we have replicas of the same block in different private caches. Right? So that's fine as long as we're reading, just reading the data because it's the same data. But as soon as one of those processors tries to write to one of those blocks, to, to that same shared block, we could have a sort of a conflict, right? We could have stale data in the other cache. Right? So our solution, so, so don't worry about this too much. Uh, we have a solution for this. And the solution is to implement cache coherence. All right, and our cache coherence mechanisms will basically just track the blocks as they come in and out of the caches, right? And we'll use uh, different states to, to um, note of whether the data is shared or exclusively held or is dirty or is clean. Right? And when writes to that writes to blocks occur, it will make sure that no other cache has a copy of the block. Right? So we're gonna force the whatever process, what, whichever processor wants to write to a block, we're gonna force it to make sure that it has the only copy of the block before the write is allowed to happen. Right? And the process of uh, forcing the data out of other caches, shared data out of other caches is known as invalidation. It's going to make the block invalid in other people's caches. Um, and then this kind of works well. There's no programmer intervention for correctness. Everything just kind of um, works, sort of, right? Um, in reality, these mechanisms are very complicated to design and even more complicated to verify and make sure you have the correct semantics. Um, but it's sort of like a swan, right, on, on a lake, right, you know, looks very graceful from above the surface, but then below, it's paddling like crazy, right? So for the program, programmer, this is what this is like. Okay, so what happens with these coherence misses, right? Why do we care? What are they, what's interesting here? So it turns out that we have these coherence misses when, whenever we have data sharing, right? So a cache block is shared across two processors, P1 and P2. P1 uh, does a write to the block, and then the system will invalidate P2's copy, right? So that's an invalidation, and evicts the block out of P2's cache. So the next time that P2 does a read from the same block, it misses, right? So these invalidations force misses on other processors. Okay, so we have two types of sharing patterns. We have true sharing patterns. So true sharing, P1 is gonna write a block, 
or write to a word, and P2 is going to read from the exact same word. Right. So this is true sharing because P2 is actually reading data that's written by P1. Right. So there's actual read after write. Right. And, and, and as you write parallel programs, right, that run on multi-cores, this is how data is shared between uh, threads via this mechanism. All right, the other type of sharing we can have is false sharing. So under false sharing, what happens is P1 writes to one uh, word in a block. P2 has a copy of the block in its cache, and it reads from a different word. So notice there's, no, there's not any real data sharing going on. The problem is that the granularity of which we're tracking the coherence is at the block level. So we cannot distinguish between, um, or the system at least cannot distinguish between this being uh, a true exchange of data and just reads and writes to the same block. All right, so this is known as false sharing. So note, you know, you have to enforce the coherence and invalidate P2's block, even though you're not even really sharing data, right? All right. So what I'm going to assume now, right, is I'm going to assume that we have a nice parallel program that we've written, and it works correctly, and we now want to get good performance on a multi-core system. What are we going to do? So I'm going to assume first that you've applied all the classic capped up cache optimizations and you've done sort of everything reasonable that you could expect to do to your program before you, you, you run it on your multi-core, right? So you're going to apply all the classic cache optimizations that you, that you learned, right? And I'm also going to assume that you have um, done enough analysis to know to choose your right task assignment um, correctly, right? So you ideally, right, um, you want to use some sort of static task assignment when the tasks are homogenous and the work is very predictable and hopefully you want to use some dynamic approach when there's variance and more uncertainty. Okay. So what you should probably do is start after you've done all those sort of very basic things, right, uh, just sort of don't get too cute, right? Just write something that works, right? Um, and then, once you've done that and you start to run it, try to get some, understand some of the key properties, right? right? Profile, right? And for each task, right, you want to know essentially what is the sort of latency of the task and what is its sort of data footprint. What, what are the relationships between the tasks? Right? So what's, what common data do they, do they share? Right? What common critical sections do they have? All right. Try to figure out bottlenecks, right? And this is probably going to have to be an iterative process. And there are lots of knobs you can turn. You can turn the thread, no thread count knob, right? So the idea is that you're not necessarily going to maximize performance by any three increasing your thread count for lots of different reasons. Mapping, so where the threads end up mapped, right, which cores, and how you place your data. Right. All right. These are kind of standard things that you can, you can twiddle with. So first case is that your data uh, fits well within your private caches. Right? So if you, take, if you have two threads and you're trying to figure out um, how they should be mapped relative to each other. If their data, common data, fits well within your private caches, then it might be a reasonable thing to do to have them assigned to separate logical cores within the same physical core via hyperthreading. Hyper right? Right? So ideally, right, you'll have, because the data fits, you're going to have low miss rates for your private cache. Right? And then this will all be good. And if these, these tasks are, if this uh, workload is data parallel, right, all the tasks are, all the threads are executing the same uh, instructions, 
So hopefully, right, the instructions all fit within your instruction cache, right, your shared instruction cache on your hyperthreading. So you're going to get good um, instruction cache behavior. Low miss rate there. Right? In addition to the, the data fitting as well. OK. So if these threads don't fit well within the same uh, private caches, then hopefully they fit within the same last level cache. Right? And if that's the case, you can assign them to different physical thread cores on the same, sh on the same chip. Right? So in this case, then, you hopefully minimize your off-chip accesses, get good performance there. Right? So you might still pay some penalty right, for these L3 accesses, particularly if they're far away. So if the threads don't fit well within your last level cache, then the next option is to map them to different threads, uh, to chips, different sockets. And there, right, you're trying to um, do your best to make most of your um, LLC on each, uh, on each chip. Okay. All right. So that's, that basically mostly addressed capacity issues. But there's some other communication costs that we have to consider, right? Um, so what about data sharing, right? So if the, the you're going to, for whatever algorithm, right, if it's most parallel algorithms, there's some degree, significant, uh, there's some degree of sharing, uh, true data sharing, right? So for example, you think of a matrix multiplication. Um, however, um, so that's basically an aspect of sharing that's sort of intrinsic to the algorithm, and there's not much you can do beyond some point. Right? So there are other ways in which you can have sort of uh, extra communication latency beyond what you would lab based on just mismatches between the architecture and implementation, and those are things we can do something about. So the first thing to consider is locality awareness. So if I have uh, threads that share objects or critical sections, right, I can think about uh, the sort of true sharing or coherence misses that are associated with them. Right? And I want to try to place those threads as close together as I can to minimize the communication costs, right? If we think back to the latencies that it had with regard to accesses in different caches, right? The closer we put these threads together, right? The lower the communication cost will be, right? But we, have to, we still have to balance this with the actual capacity issues as well, right? Because we, if, if we, we want to put them closer together because they're communicating frequently, but we also have to respect the capacity issues. So if we put them on the same core, right, or on the same chip, but their, their, uh, their data, or the, the union of their data doesn't fit within the caches, then we have problems, even though we've minimized the, the sort of communication-related uh, access latencies, we probably introduced a lot of capacity-related cache misses as well. So you have to balance these things. All right, the other issue is false sharing, right? So we're going to have false sharing again any time that we have um, read and write access to the same blocks without exchanging data, all right? And this is something that often leads to very unexpected results, right? Um, so this is, again, due to the, the, the granularity in which the coherence is, is enforced, and the way to do this is to rearrange your data, right? And you're going to try to align objects and pad data structures so that you don't have these um, disastrous um, 
sharing patterns. Right? So this can be tricky sometimes because what you're doing at this point, right, to do this padding or not, you're actually increasing the data footprint of your applications. Right? So this can lead to kind of capacity uh, misses as well if you're not careful. Right? So you're going to try to, you, you, you try to eliminate these false sharing, but uh, you can't, you got to be careful about this because you don't want to make the, you, wanna, you don't want to have a negative impact on capacity misses. Okay. All right. So that's mostly what I wanted to talk about. Um, I, there's a lot of other kind of interesting kind of future directions, right? So we're nearing the end of Moore's law, but there's still a lot, um, there's still a lot more to explore, right? So heterogeneity is very interesting, right? So the idea we have different um, power performance uh, profiles for different cores, and we even build chips that have a variety of different cores, different capabilities. Um, there are lots of kind of interesting trade-offs that you can have. So I think um, the other thing that we're seeing and that we'll continue to see is specialization. Right? So dark silicon in particular is, is kind of a big driver of this. We're going to see accelerators for any and everything. Right? Um, then finally, uh, cache organizations. Right? So uh, there are lots of different ways we're going to put caches together using different sort of building blocks, right? And potentially having sort of different ways to dynamically configure your cache, right? To give you sort of different sizes, different associativities, uh, different levels of your cache, among other things, okay? All right, so that's basically what I wanted to say. So if you have questions, I'm happy to take them. <laughs>